So today I want to talk about the question of how many Leonard Jones atom types a force field ought to have. And to introduce this topic, I'm going to go back to a slide that uh, David Mobley used in his uh, talk for this workshop, which is shown here, which is about automatic parameter fitting in, in open force field. So the basic idea here is that one starts with a force field with a set of initial parameters and then uses uh, the uh, open force field infrastructure, and in our case, uh, focusing on uh, force balance parameter optimizer to compute a set of uh, uh, quantities that one can compare with reference data. So these are experimentally uh, available data like heats of vaporization and densities of pure organic liquids, as well as quantum mechanical uh, available quantities like the uh, torsional energy profiles of uh, rotatable bonds. Well, so one computes these quantities using the force field, does a comparison, and then does it a, an adjustment of the parameters that should yield an improved force field. Shown here, goes back, runs the calculations again, compares with the reference data again, and iterates to convergence, at which point one has a set of presumably better uh, force field parameters. One can then benchmark the force field, and if it works well, uh, have a new force field release. But what this uh, process doesn't address is exactly what parameters one is optimizing. Uh, you know, what are the appropriate Leonard Jones types for which one has numerical parameters to adjust? What are the bond types uh, and so forth? Uh, this has been the topic of some work at Open Force Field, really led by um, Caitlin Bannon when she was a graduate student in David Mobley's lab. Um, the process, the idea of coming up with a method of uh, automatically assigning uh, types, but it's still, I, I think, an unsolved problem. So if we now look at uh, Leonard Jones atom types in a recent force, Open Force Field release, it turns out there are 20 uh, for the elements hydrogen, carbon, oxygen, and nitrogen. Uh, it turns out there are actually a number of types for hydrogen and fewer types for carbon, as shown in green, oxygen, and red, and, and only one for nitrogen. And to get a sense for what's going on here, um, if we look at hydrogen, there's a default string, so all hydrogens will match this string. But if the hydrogen you're typing in your molecule happens to be bound to an sp3 carbon, as shown here, then it'll be assigned uh, specialized uh, parameters for that. If that carbon happens to be bound to one, two or even three electronegative elements as shown in the next three lines, then um, it'll be assigned further specialized parameters and so forth. And you go down the list doing these assignments. Similarly for carbon, there's a, a default parameter which could get modified if it turns out to be an SP or an SP3 uh, type car carbon. Uh, putting this set in context, so as I said, there are 20 HCO and N Leonard Jones types in open force field currently. GAF 1.8 has 48, as best I can tell, and CGENFF, which is a charm general force field, a recent release has 130. But it's important to note that um, it's not really clear, uh, certainly for GAF, and I imagine for CGENFF, how uh, just really different all these parameters are. In, in GAF, certainly many of the nitrogen parameters uh, are identical uh, and probably should be, not be viewed as independent types, even though they're listed as independent. And so there's, there may not really be so many independent Leonard Jones types in these other force fields, but they're, they're listed that way. And when it comes to doing a, an optimization like this, it's not entirely clear which ones should be considered as uh, identical and kept together and which ones should be allowed to vary independently. With that as background, the question is how many Leonard Jones types, types should a force field have? And I would argue that we want the minimal number of types required to reach maximal accuracy. And, uh, and of course, that depends on the data set you're using to assess accuracy and on what the other force field terms are. But the basic idea is diagrammed in this little uh, sort of conceptual graph where the uh, y-axis shows accuracy and the x-axis shows a number of Leonard Jones types. One can imagine that if you treat all elements as identical, so you have one type for all elements, you won't get very high accuracy. If you allow each element one type, and you'll see that we're going to try that in a moment, you should get better accuracy. If you allow perhaps two types per element, it should get better and so forth. But there's probably also an, some sort of asymptotic uh, limit uh, because at a certain point, a carbon, the Leonard Jones parameters probably are not very dependent on whether there's an oxygen uh, or a sulfur five bonds away. Why do we want to minimize the number of Leonard Jones types? Uh, you know, why do we want the minimum number to achieve maximal accuracy? I think there are two reasons aside from just plain simplicity. 
One of them is to reduce the dimensionality of the optimization problem. So if this is a diagram of some objective function, some measure, measure of error, and we want to find a global optimum, the epsilon and sigma as shown here with lowest um, error, uh, that may or may not be uh, a simple problem, but as you add more and more dimensions, so more epsilons and more sigmas, it's likely to get more problematic. In addition, uh, having fewer parameters reduces the risk of overfitting where you get good looking results on your training set, but they, it doesn't really, the force field doesn't work well on uh, uh, data outside your training set. So what I'm gonna talk about here is a study that was uh, led by uh, Michael Schauperl, a uh, postdoc in my lab, um, where we define a set of Leonard Jones typing models, uh, really keeping them quite simple. For example, one of them would be H2CON, so two hydrogen types, one carbon type, one oxygen type, and one nitrogen type. We use Li Ping Wang's uh, force balance gradient based optimizer to optimize the parameters associated with this model against experimental training set data. And then we evaluate the accuracy of the resulting uh, force field against test set data. And then we compare with other models. So uh, Spurnoff 99 Frost, a fairly recent version, and uh, GAF 1.8. The other parameters in these calculations are, are drawn from Smirnoff 99 Frost. So this is a picture of the Leonard Jones typing schemes we looked at. And they're, they're in several groups. The top group starts with HCON. So that's one type per element. So all hydrogens are the same, all carbons are the same, et cetera. And then we looked at splitting the hydrogen types in a chemically motivated manner, but keeping the others the same. Splitting the carbons, splitting the oxygens, or splitting the nitrogens, and then taking all the splits, putting them together to make a 12 type model with H4, C3, O3, N2. The next set starts with a split between polar and apolar hydrogens, keeping the other elements the same. So one type for carbon, one type for oxygen, and then did similar splits for carbon oxygen and nitrogen. And finally, here we have Smirnoff 99 Frost, uh, which has 15 types represented in the uh, training and test sets that I'll show you in a moment, and GAF 1.8, which has 28 types in our compound set. So uh, I'm not gonna go through this table in detail, but this is really just to give you a sense for how we did the splits. So for example, for carbon, when we split carbon into three types, they were simply sp2, sp3, and sp. When we split oxygen, it was simply carbonyl, alcohol, and ether, and so forth. And then at the bottom, we have the apolar polar hydrogen splits based on whether they're bonded to a nitrogen or an oxygen or not. Uh, we use a set of compounds with 78 molecules in it that capture uh, 15 of the 20 Smirnoff HCON Leonard Jones types. And we did the calculations with two splits, training test splits, of the set of 78 compounds. I'll be showing the results from only the first split today because time is short, but the results are uh, virtually identical for the other split. So the first split is shown here, the training set on the left, test set on the right. And the other training set, we just drew the compounds colored in um, orange out and use those for training and the rest for testing. For training, we use heats of vaporization and densities for these pure organic liquids. And for testing, we use the same types of data plus dielectric constants. So let's look at the results. Uh, one simple result is that when we use the uh, ridiculously simple model of one Leonard Jones type or element, it's not that bad. It's not great, but it's not as bad as one might have imagined. These are test set results. In the table, we see the pictorial representation of the types. Here's the name of the model, so HCON, Smirnoff, and GAF. This is mean percent error on densities, mean percent error on heats of vaporization, mean percent error on dielectric constants. And the objective function is a nice summary. It's the objective function that force balance minimizes uh, to reduce error. So a low number is better. And the cells are colored where uh, orange is worse and blue is better. So here, what you see is that the objective function for HCON is 243. Smirnoff and GAF are, are better. Uh, perhaps not dramatically better. If you look at the actual numbers here, heats of vaporization are similar in accuracy, dielectric constants are similar in accuracy, maybe H2N is a little better, but the densities for this, for this model are a little bit worse. Another very clear result was that simply distinguishing between polar and nonpolar hydrogens gives you uh, a huge boost in accuracy, and it gives you almost the, all, almost the entire boost in accuracy that we've seen in any other model. So you can see that in a few comparisons. Let's look at the top two lines. 
we go from HCON to H2CON, so that polar apolar split, and the objective function falls by uh, not quite a factor of two, and uh, these other uh, results tend to get better. So heats of vaporization get better, densities get better, dielectric constants for some reason got a little worse. But here are some more comparisons. Let's go from HC3ON and split the hydrogens. We go to H2C3ON and we up, uh, yeah, and we get uh, a drop in the objective function from HCO3N to H2CO3N. We get a small drop in the objective function. And from HCON2, so split nitrogens, and now we split the hydrogens, H2CON2, we get another nice reduction. And um, so in all cases, splitting the hydrogens into polar and apolar improves the results. And in fact, gives us results that are, uh, at least on this you know, test set, uh, better than Smirnoff and GAF. Uh, I'm not trying to claim that this is a better model necessarily, which is a very limited test set, but it's uh, certainly uh, something to think about. Uh, we then can look at more generally, we looked a little bit at just a very simple split for the hydrogens, but if we split the hydrogens into four types, we get improvements, so that's 243 to 153, these, this first green arrow. If we split oxygen types from HCON to HCO3N, we also get improvement, uh, actually about uh, the same as splitting hydrogens. Um, interestingly, for this, both, for both test sets, uh, splitting carbons uh, makes things worse on the test set, and splitting nitrogens makes things worse on the test set. Not a lot, but but not, but it's not better. So that those seem to be split seem to be of secondary value, if any value at all in this context. And finally, uh, we find that some runs uh, and don't find the global optimum. Uh, so here we look at a training set because that's where we're going to see whether the optimum was found or not. And I want to give you two comparisons. Let's start off with HCO3N and add parameters to make this 12 parameter model, H4C3O3N2, objective function is worse after training. Uh, and, or if we just split the hydrogens in the last line, the objective function also gets worse than for the simpler model. And we know that um, because the more complicated models, the ones with more parameters, have more freedom in principle, the achievable objective function with a more complicated model has to be at least as good as that with a simpler model and probably a little bit better because there's more freedom for uh, optimization. And we're seeing uh, the opposite. So what happened here, and actually Michael did a, a really nice analysis of this. What we noticed is that, uh, so HCO3N is considerably better than HCON, which I don't show here. And what's happening of course is that the three different types of oxygens are being assigned distinct parameters. When he looked at H2CO3N from this optimization, he noticed that the oxygen parameters were actually pretty similar to each other. And basically what had happened is we'd gotten a polar apolar hydrogen split. So that raised the possibility that somehow this optimization wandered off into a false optimum or a local optimum where the hydrogens were split, but the oxygens weren't. So to check that, he did a, new, a fresh optimization of H2CO3N starting from HCO3N. So we start with the split oxygens and re-optimize to get this re-optimized model. And now the objective function is a little bit lower, maybe the same in effect as HC3ON. So it's fallen relative to the prior optimization where we had 84. And indeed, when we looked at the parameters for H2CO3N re-optimized, the oxygens were again split and the hydrogens had very similar parameters. So there seem to be two pretty good ways of optimizing H2CO3N parameters. One is to split the hydrogens, the other one is to split the oxygens, and the optimizer risks getting trapped in the false minima. So let me uh, wrap up by uh, summarizing and suggesting some implications. It looks, you know, from this preliminary study as though using surprisingly few atom types may be advantageous. We get um, competitive test set accuracy. Um, it's a way of avoiding overfitting and it limits the search dimensionality. Um, and indeed, um, even for quite few parameters, so H2CO3N is, what is it? Um, you know, take the number of types and multiply by two, that's how many parameters it has. There is danger of getting caught in, um, in local optima. So this suggests that in future optimization work, it may be worth at least using multiple starting points in our optimizations or maybe considering other ways to improve the global search.
Um, so uh, going back to our graph uh, from before, we can maybe put uh, sort of an impressionistic set of uh, data on here. This is not meant to be quantitative, but if we look at accuracy versus number of Leonard Jones types, it's not so great for HCON. We get a nice boost in accuracy by adding by splitting hydrogens, and we get modest boosts potentially by splitting nitrogens and uh, oxygens. Uh, so I'll wrap up by uh, acknowledging uh, uh, primarily Michael Schauperl, who's really done all this work and done a, a beautiful job of it. Unfortunately, he'll be for us. He'll be moving on to uh, uh, greener pastures or, or different shade of green pastures soon. Um, Sophie Canton and a grad student with us who uh, uh, developed some of the initial ideas and Li Ping Wang who's uh, helped with force balance and interpretation uh, of the data. Thanks to everyone in open force field, especially for earlier discussions of this work and to NIH for uh, funding. Thank you. That's great, thanks. Um, so, yeah, I guess if we were continuing, well, I'm gonna wanna make sure Simon is thinking about this. If we were continuing on with, you know, maybe trying to connect some of this with the new the Leonard Jones refitting going into release force fields, it might make sense to do a couple of refits that start with a pretty minimal model, like one of the ones you guys have tried and see um, how that fares. Which one were ones which would be your first picks for, for trying? Um, I would, I totally depend. Okay, so if I, we were only gonna do one, I would do either, a, I would probably do H2CO3N. Um, but if we were gonna do two or three, I would probably do the three at the top here. So H2CON, even though I say it's lower accuracy than the other two, um, it's not impressively lower. I mean, so if we look at, uh, where is that? Uh, H2CON is 139 on the objective function. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's amazing. If we add oxygen split, we get to 142, which is not as good on the test set, and N2 is not as good. But I'm tempted to split the oxygens and nitrogens anyhow, because we've seen that on their own, they can improve things. Um, what do you, Michael Schaupel is on the line, I think. He may have some thoughts on this as well. Michael Schaupel, you're muted if you're trying to say anything. Yes. Um, yeah, I more or less would have the same suggestion. So H2CO3N would be my first choice if we only test one. And uh, if we would test two or three, I would probably take this one and then probably the ones Mike suggested. Those were the ones which are, were standing out. You could even go further and set the bare minimum as a HCON, so the just the element-wise atom type or type model, which would be interesting. Do you, um, are the smarts patterns you guys used for those in the paper? Yeah, so, um, uh, they sh wait, they're here too. They're here. You see them oh, on right. the right? I missed them. Yeah. 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 Okay. They're, they're, we've, I think uh, what we did is essentially take sort of top level Smirnoff yeah. smarts. Yeah. Smirk, whatever they are. Cool. Yeah. So uh, I'll make sure, you know, Simon is thinking about this. It, I think it'd be neat, you know, it, it, to some extent, this just depends on compute because automating it is trivial. So it'd be neat to, you know, repeat whatever fitting he's doing um after the 1.2 release um right. you know as he as he finishes as he finalizes how he's going to be fitting and testing his lj refits to also just do the same thing with your you know one or two of these types of of typing and see what works best yeah, yeah. so this yeah, is a larger scale right. version of your same experiment yeah exactly i mean i think that would be fascinating 